let me try to share my screen. Uh, okay. Okay, good. So, like Lorenzo, I would like to apologize to my colleague of the morning section for not being able to be awake at three in the morning. Um, hopefully, I, we will do better tomorrow morning. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizer and prof especially Professor Laffey for their commendable effort in making this conference a reality despite the current circumstances. Now more than ever, maintaining a sense of community and sharing our project help us to remain focused and ready for the time when our lives will return to a semblance of normality. I thank Professor D'Alfonso for inviting me to be part of the Kinikoyu project all the sponsors that provide us with much needed resources, all the local workers that are essential to the excavation on site, and the large team of colleagues that has worked in Area A for their expertise. Excavation at Area E commenced in 2016 with the intent of uncovering Hellenistic level of occupations to the south of the Northwest building that you heard about from Lorenzo and that is marked as area A1 in this image. So we worked in 2016 in uh, sub area E1, then we moved to sub area E2 in 2017, and in 2018 and 2019 to sub area E3, which is the subject of this presentation. And that is the area that I'm circling now on my screen. In terms of relative chronology, the earliest Hellenistic phase that was uncovered at Area E3 are the remains of a rather imposing plaza that was paved in medium to large size cobblestone. And you can see the cobblestone clearly on this picture, on the uh, collage uh, from the top and on the plan. At present, we have excavated an area of about 17 meters east-west and five meters north-south. The plaza was close to the north by the citadel Achaemenid and Hellenistic fortification wall, and to the east by the walls of an imposing structure that was first uncovered during the 2019 season by the mission vice director, Professor Burak Yolachan. Possibly located to the south of the plaza was a religious complex, as attested by an important group of decorative material they was washed down onto the plaza. So you see over here the walls that are closing to the north. And our argument is that the religious complex would be somewhere in the south, uh, an area that is currently still unexcavated and that we are hoping uh, to tackle in our next project. But even before these floating events, the plaza had been subjected to considerable alterations. Toward this eastern end, we uncover a series of pits that were dug directly into the layers below the plaza cobblestones, as well as into the lower elevation of the fortification walls. And you can see the pit here. These are the ones that are cut directly into the cobblestone. You see the cobblestone of the plaza, and over here the pit that cuts into the citadel walls. In these two pits were intentionally deposited two stone eagle sculptures, currently under study by Professor Yola Chan. Fragments of other similar eagles were found scattered in the vicinity over the course of the last four seasons. The iconography of the two statues is similar. The upright eagles have their wings closed. Clutched in their talons are the heads of mountain goats that lie down on the right side. Both eagles are now at the Museum of Nide. We thank for the restoration and installation of the 2018 eagle, the General Directorate of Antiquity, the Museum of Nide and its director, Dr. Fazil Achiguz, and the generosity of Turk Trator that financially supported this project. While eagles perch on bulls and stags are quite widespread, Eagles on mountain goat seem to reflect a more regional tradition, relatively understudied. Eagles are often associated to the cult of Zeus, and this god seems to have been venerated at the Argaios, the biggest mountain of the region. 
the finding of a fragmentary inscription that you see over here next to the, to the 2019 eagle mentions paratondia and confirms the presence of a statue of Zeus. The expression paratondia could even refer to the existence of a temple to Zeus in the context of Kinikoyu. The inscription, which also mentions a group of personal names, is currently studied by ISO professor Roger Bagnall and doctoral student Georgios Solakis. Sometime after the botted pits were filled, the plaza was covered by a thick layer of debris and mud, resulted from significant flooding episodes. These deposits were carried down onto the plaza from a higher area located immediately to the south. We see in the plan the trajectory of the debris that they were stopped for the most part by the citadel walls. The finding of some debris beyond this line of walls suggest the presence of a gate through which most of the material must have passed to be deposited farther to the south. And so in the image here, particularly, you see very well the trajectory of this debris that would eventually hit over here the fortification wall. And you also see the remain of this mud layer that I was discussing about that sits directly onto the plaza and is a very thick mud layer, almost completely deprived of findings. Scattered among the debris were hundreds of thick fire clay fragments. Most are not diagnostic, as you can see from these images, but some, such horns, muzzles, shanks, and hooves, can be recognized as part of bovine figures. The restoration of this material is overseen by restorer Nazim Jan Jihan, and what I'm presenting here are only the very preliminary results of my investigation. The importance of the study and restoration of this material has been recognized by the United States mission in Turkey that has generally assigned to the project a grant from the US Ambassador Fund for Cultural Preservation. And I give you here an idea, as I said, of the sheer quantity of the material, both the uh, not diagnostic, but here, as you can see, you have some diagnostic pieces, the muzzle over here and the horns over here. Among the corpus of material are recognizable large bovine protomies characterized by complex bridal decorations over here. Prominent dewlap line over here and uh, most interesting open mouths. Some of these protomies could be, could have been part of sculptural ensembles while others might have functioned as architectural fixture. The largest fragment attests to the presence of close to life size and in the round terracotta bovine statues, some of which were depicted as bovine lying down with the legs tucked under their bellies, while others were fully standing. As you see, this larger piece ends over here, suggesting that the legs were tucked down, whereas the shank and the hoofs over here suggest the presence of sculpture that instead represented the bovine as standing. Finally, we were able to recognize a third type of bovine figurines. These are in the shape of smaller and flat protomies that are likely to be interpreted as attachment to large vessels or a small architectural decoration. And you see at the back of the figurines that clearly indicates as they were meant to be attached to some other surface. The religious nature of this corpus of material was confirmed by the finding in the same debris level of four anthropomorphic terracotta busts. Upon close examination, I was able to recognize the image of the Greek god Dionysus over here, which is flanked by a satyr. Here you can see the satyr mounted on a mule and holding a pole above his shoulder that has on both hands a bunch of graves. From the same context comes the bust of the goddess Athena over here. And you can recognize her helmet, the Aegis, and a stylized gorgon. Another female bust, possibly Ariadne or a manad, is shown with the head or the mask of a satyr over here at her side. 
The most notable feature of these last two busts is that they were attached to the two sides of a dewlap of a bovine figure. And you can see very clearly here the line of the dewlap. Therefore, we must imagine that some of the bovine that I showed you before had images of the Hellenistic gods attached directly onto their bodies. I would like to draw your attention to the Kinnick Dionysus, whose iconography and style find close comparisons in other examples of the young Dionysus type as represented in busts and figuring from the second century BCE. It is indeed this material that allows us to better define the chronological spectrum of the decorative corpus of area E3, including the bovine terracotta, at the same time providing important clues on the religious life of late Hellenistic Kinnick. As I mentioned, my study of area three material is still in its early phases. My search for comparative material has brought me to look at site and religious practices from Hellenistic location in Asian Minor and beyond, attesting to the widespread presence of the cults of Daphina, Dionysus, and to the use of bovine figures and rit as ritual offerings. However, to my knowledge, no other site has attestation of bovines that are decorated with busts or medallion of Greek god, such the one at Kinnick, and I would welcome any feedback on the subject from you today. The presence of Greek divinities depicted according to a markedly Hellenized visual language brings into question the religious traditions present at the site. If we compare the findings from Area E with those from the Northwest building that you just heard about from Lorenzo, we can identify clear distinctions among the two corpora according to their chronology. The 4th to 3rd century BC finds from the Northwest Building on the top, and they are currently studied by Professor Maria Elena Gorrini, speak of cults rooted into the local, long lasting Anatolian religious tradition. This tradition is reflected in monuments in the region that identify the presence in the cultic landscape of the storm god and female mother and vegetation goddesses. It is interesting to note the finds of this period, namely cattle and birds of prey, are exclusively zoomorphic. The Hellenization of Cappadocia, as promoted by the first Basileus Ariarates III and his successor, is instead reflected in the dramatic stylistic changes of the Kinnick zoomorphic figures that dates to the second and first century BCE. While the subjects remain in overall similar, birds of prey and cattle, the techniques, scale, and iconographic motifs take on a distinctive Hellenized flavor. Additionally, anthropomorphic figures depicting Greek divinities or inspired by Hellenistic motifs appear on site at this later Hellenistic phase. Few anthropomorphic figurines also dated to the second or first century BC and also being found at the Northwest building, and I put over here the three figurines from the Northwest building. We are still in the early stages in the study of these two contexts, but it seems evident that these changes in religious imagery reflect changes in the divinities venerated at Kinnick and their related cults. The subject of religious syncretism in Hellenistic Anatolian Cappadocia has been of interest in recent scholarship. The general consensus is one where pre-existing Anatolian gods are reinterpreted into Greek divinities with whom they share similar characteristics. The corpus of material from Kinnick offers the unique opportunity to test this theory vis-a-vis -vis fully documented archaeological context. Ultimately, the juxtaposition of the second century BCE figures from area E against those of the 4th century BCE at the Northwest Building indicates a religious shift at Kinnick in the late Hellenistic period. Currently, it's still premature to identify this shift as the immediate result of religious syncretism, but the data is extensive enough to safely interpret this change as an act of religious accommodation. Furthermore, the quality and craftsmanship of the material excavated in Area E 
points at a sponsorship or at least influence from the ruling family, thus opening interesting scenarios on the role of Kinikoyu in late Hellenistic Cappadocia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kazagant. Kim, I'm trying to clap again. Yes, it works. Can everybody hear me? So I thank both the speakers for these uh, twin presentations, which were, which were extremely interesting. We now have, uh, uh, I would say, some 10 minutes for questions, if Ergun agrees. We can't hear you again. Microphone. Yes, of course. Um, well, I will say uh, we do have like 15 minutes of discussion if uh, both of our speakers are still not too tired to reply. Is that okay? Oh, oh great. Yeah, yeah perfect. Fully fit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you Good. go. Then if anybody has questions, you can either write in the chat uh, or uh, directly intervene. No, I don't guess. Any questions? I will. Uh, I have a question. Oh, please. Uh, I wasn't able to, if I'm not interrupting anybody. No, you're not. Go on. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Tomasz Kishbali from the Moscow State University. The, uh, the question is, uh, thank, I thank, thank both, both uh, presenters for this very interesting material from, from Kinik Hayuk. And the, the question is to Roberta, mostly, mm -hmm. uh, regarding the, uh, these bull heads. Uh, have you, uh, do you have any, any, thought about this is a very peculiar um, feature of these bullheads is how prominent the teeth are displayed yeah. uh, which is quite rare and uh, what are your thoughts because I was if you if we look at m most depictions of for example sacrificial bulls uh, they are usually not not so prominent but you can often see the teeth of the bull or at least the gate the, the, the mouth of the bull is open not so much in sacrificial scenes, but in scenes of like animal combat when a lion is attacking the bull, it's, yeah. it's more likely. But what are your comments on this? Uh, on this? Yes, um, everything about this corpus of material is quite unusual. <laughs> and that is why, as you saw on the map, I, I'm looking at so many different sites because I couldn't really find close comparison. Um, in generally speaking, in the scholarship that I saw, uh, the mention is that when the mouth is open, the animal is dead uh, and has been already sacrificed. Uh, but I don't think this is necessarily the case um, at Kinnick. Uh, we often joke that our cows are smiling. Um, I cannot really tell for, <laughs> for sure whether they're smiling or not, but it's definitely an interesting um, aspect of this corpus, which, as I said, is quite unique. And as you can see, I don't know if we want to share again. Uh, all done. Actually, we can still see your presentation. Just uh, sharing. Yeah. So you okay. Show. As you can see, we have even different kind of technique used. So uh, it's fascinating in the smaller one, often, as you can see, the teeth are actually added in three dimensionally, uh, but in the bigger one are uh, somewhat instead, uh, yeah, we are. They are somewhat instead carved in. Uh, so there are different approaches. And I think that and the bridal are two aspects of this corpus that are also very interesting because as you can see, there are different kind of, of techniques. We have uh, the more elaborate over here. Uh, we have, again, a crisscrossing uh, type over here, but then we have this sort of sun looking kind of bridal over here. So I think that for several aspects, there are, um, details that are not common in uh, the other cattle images that I've been seeing so far from the Hellenistic period of before. Uh, and that is one I open the floor and ask any of you uh, if you have idea of other material that is similar. Because so far as you rightly pointed out, I saw bovines that are uh, relatively simpler in terms of uh, decorative details, but especially that have the mouth closed. And that's why I pointed out in the presentation that this is also very unusual from our side. Very I don't think though that they are dead. I don't think that they are meant to be dead, like as I said, are a scholar of say for other bovines with open mouths. Yeah, I, I do agree that they seem to be alive, but maybe in pain. <laughs> Uh, I'm afraid that they, well, that, that's my, my uh, uh, yeah, but uh, the, an, another, uh, another uh, image where I remember bovines with, uh, with open mouths is, is in Mitraic 
imagery when mm -hmm. Lisa is grabbing. Of course. But that, but there you have. But of course, it's probably not very much connected to this one. But that's why I thought that this might be a not just the regular sacrifice when the creature is supposed to be calm and sedated, sort of. But this is a more violent. That's why I had this association that this might be a more violent type of, of sacrifice. Yeah. For which so we have far is impossible. That's why I'm, I'm, we're really waiting to go back and get the restoration going because uh, with all the fragments that we have, we hope to be able to put together at least one full um, statue because for something like this kind of statue that we have reconstructed so far, uh, it looks like as if the cow is actually just lying down, not necessarily dead or not necessarily in a moment of sacrifice. But as I said, if we get to have one that is fully completed, then we can better argue whether it's a moment of sacrifice or whether, um, you know, like some, in some Cypriot sanctuary, uh, they are meant just to decorate the architecture and not necessarily point at the sacrifice. Also, the problem, as I was mentioning, is the fact that uh, the bulls seems to have these Greek divinities attached to their neck in which case they are not in the moment of the sacrifice. You may even wonder whether the bull is a representation for one of the gods, right? Since there is this association yeah. with Zeus at least in the inscription. Thank you. Okay, I have other questions here. One from Dr. Uh, Georgia or Georgia Aristodemo. Hello. Um, uh, firstly, congratulations to both uh, Roberta and Lorenzo uh, for the um, uh, excellent presentation. I am, I'm just wondering about the, the figures of uh, the Hellenized figures of Dionysus and the eagle. Um, they do bring to mind um, uh, iconographical uh, style from um, uh, Greek lands or Asia Minor. Um, works. Uh, so, uh, do you have any information about the people creating these um, uh, monuments? Uh, for example, um, um, having also the, the Greek inscription, <coughs> forgive me, uh, do, do you have people of Greek origin there? Or um, is it something uh, permanent? Do they live there permanently? Do you know um, anything? Do you have any information about that? Lorenzo, you want to speak? Well, uh, uh, I, I can only say some generic words. Uh, uh, in, uh, in generic term, we know through uh, the sources that uh, 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 with uh, Ariarathis V, uh, we start having uh, artisans and uh, uh, um, artists in general moving from uh, Athens directly and brought back uh, uh, from the main, uh, from the head of the court of, of uh, the kingdom of Cappadocia into their territory. As for our uh, materials, uh, um, that, the, the um, PhD student at ISO, uh, Georgios Solakis, brought my attention to a broken inscription in which we have uh, one Enaios. And uh, he was looking at the all different possible um, integrations of it, and Athenaios is still the most uh, likely. By the way, Athenaios as an ethnic ethnicon is uh, attested in uh, in the corpus that uh, Berges and Nolet have collected. So uh, this might be uh, well. In that case, it should be someone who donated an object. It is on on uh, one a ceramic fragment. This name possibly now we understand belonging to the rich material that that Roberta. Uh, has has shown to you uh, possibly so this is uh, our working hypothesis and Roberta maybe you can add some more of the work uh, that in particular Alessio Mantovan has done on the uh, petrography of mm -hmm. uh, of the bulls pre preliminary as it is of course. Yeah. well first of all we should also mention that the inscription that we show that was founded with the eagle has three personal names so I don't want to speak for uh, our philologists. Uh, they, are, they will publish it and there will be more information, but there are three Greek names. So there is 
um, a tradition of Greek names. And, but I don't, as I said, I'm not a specialist, so I don't want to add anything more about the origin of those names. They will. Um, in terms of the pottery, uh, the fabric of the pottery is local. Uh, so it doesn't seem as if uh, these objects were imported. And also, you know, the, the material is so thick and heavy that it's really difficult to transport from far away. But definitely, as I was trying to point out, and as Lorenzo was trying to point out, there is really a shift between the fourth century material and the second century material. And that's also one of the reasons, as I said, that I'm casting such a wide ne net in trying to find comparative material because it does look very Greek, whatever we want to say with that. Or um, perhaps... Perhaps it would be an attempt to use uh, a common language, a more Hellenized language, so that their local divinities would be more widely diffused. Yeah, yeah. And also there are things that, are, you know, if you look at them from the Greek perspective, don't make sense. Like, why would you have a manad with Athena on the same bull? Why would you have the gods on the bull? Unless you want to argue that the good is a personification of Zeus, right? Uh, yes. Since... So there are so many different components in, in the work of this corpus that I'm trying to put together. Um, that really makes me juggle lots of different aspects. And that's why I was very eager to present it today because you know, I was hoping also for feedback since the study is still at the beginning and there are so many moving components uh, in this material. So thank you on my behalf. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, well, of course, the situation with onomastics and actual population is pretty complex. If you compare what happens in Cyprus, for instance, during the Hellenistic phase, you have people who are clearly Semitic that sacrifice in a temple that is Greek, bearing both a Semitic and a Greek name, and we have absolutely no idea who they were. So it's very, it's very interesting how we can try to answer this kind of questions. Uh, speaking of questions, are there any more questions? Someone of those who have interacted in the chat, for instance, would like to intervene? Nobody? Um, yes, oh, I'm okay. here. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so, uh, should we maybe just announce the next um, next session, or should we maybe have a break? What would you guys suggest? Well, the boss is Nancy, if if she's still here. Nancy, did you have your late breakfast, or did you finish with your breakfast? I did. Yes, I'm still here. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> no, yes. <I'm> just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think. Uh, there's a break scheduled, isn't there, for 15 minutes or so? Um, I would say nine minutes maybe, like if...